Uh, so I'm just going to start up the uh, application sharing here. So I'm going to share the desktop. Those who are remote here uh, in just a moment should see the um, should see elements of my desktop appearing. I'll <laughs> see if I can check back in just a minute. But I'm going to be going into a lecture called um, Introduction to the AnyLogic Interface by Building Up a Simple Networked Model. Um, what I will do is, I think, uh, in the interests of time, uh, I was hoping to send this off to you before the class, but I'll, I'll just send it to everyone in, in the class as a uh, as a file, and you can follow along as a PDF uh, if you'd like to do that. Okay, so um, today we're going to be basically learning about the concepts within any logic and learning about um, some of the use of, of the interface, as well as to how it how it links in with um, with Java, uh, the language from which it's based. We're also going to be uh, going and uh, exploring the creation of experiments with any lo any logic, which is going to be very important for you pursuing your uh, problem set. Okay, so I'm sending off um, uh, the lecture slides here. They're a bit large um, at three megabytes, so they'll they'll take a moment to actually uh, uh, go out. Okay. Um, so it looks like they've gone out. So I've asked you to pull up any logic. Um, what I'd like you to do within any logic is to add in a new model project. Now I'm going to do this uh, in parallel with you to make sure that we see similar things. Um, but to do this, uh, first I'm going to close uh, close all the existing <laughs> models, and uh, you don't have to worry about this. But I have some models open here. And, and then we're going to go File New up in the upper left-hand corner. Okay, So File New, and we'll do a new model. Now, those who are remote, can you see my, uh, see my screen? If you could type something. OK, no, OK. Um, OK, still nothing there. Um, OK, fine, I will, I will try the alternative mechanism for doing that. Thanks for letting me know. Um, Okay, so uh, those who are following along, I'd like you to do a new model, and I'd like you to enter as the name for the model, Minimalist Network ABM Model, okay? Um, minimalist Network ABM Model. The exact name is, is not uh, critical, but just so we can come back to this model later, it would be good if you use that, uh, that name. Okay, um, for those who are remote, I'm switching over to a different mode of sharing this where I instead share specifically this application. And um, there we go. So I'm sharing it now. And uh, you should let me know uh, in 30 seconds whether or not you see it. Okay. Um, I know it sometimes there's a delay. So I'm going to create a minimalist, minimalist network ABM model. And um, I'm going to call it uh, three because I've done this several times before. Okay, and it'll go through a little uh, wizard here and we should do start creating new model from scratch, okay? So when you do next, it'll ask you that. You, you do start creating it from scratch and it's gonna create this, this uh, demonstration. Okay, remote folks, can you see anything on my screen like the, um, the um, any logic window? Still no, okay. Um, okay. Uh, okay, I, I see someone, uh, Neil, starting to say something. Nothing yet. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to try it one more time here. Stop. And then I'm going to start start sharing. And there we go. And here we go. Boom. Um, okay. And so I'm, I'm sharing it once again here. Um, okay. So um, what you should see if you do that file new project and you create this uh, or this new model, file new model, and then you create a model, is you should see a model created up here on the upper left-hand side of the screen called network, called whatever you named it. And there's two classes there. One is main and one is simulation. Um, so what we're seeing here is kind of a minimalist project, a project which has some global environment called, called main. This is an environment 
on which, uh, in which agents will circulate, and it's an environment in which uh, you will have a logic that applies across an entire model, so that's main. The second thing you're going to have in this minimalist model is an experiment. And this experiment is going to capture basically um, uh, scenarios that you can run, uh, scenarios of different assumptions associated with them. Now, as we'll see later in the course, uh, the experiments can be actually quite, uh, quite elaborate or quite articulated. They can involve, in fact, many particular runs of the model. But for now, it's going to be kind of synonymous with a particular run of a model with specific assumptions in place. Okay, uh, remote folks, uh, still nothing there? As far as the, um, uh, no, okay, nothing, okay. Um, so see if you can follow along with any logic by creating a new model, giving it a name, and, and just follow along verbally, and I'll do what I can to, to, to stop, to sort of try to figure out how to sh share this um, correctly. This has worked in the past, but okay, so um, we're trying again here. Um, so uh, there we go, no, okay. Okay, so uh, the next thing I'd like you to do um, after you've created that model, that empty model, is to double click on main, okay? And once you click on main, what you should see, um, so you'll see up in the left-hand corner is projects, and the lower right is properties. Now, is anyone having trouble seeing this right now? No? Okay, what are you seeing? Oh, okay. Okay. Do you want to pull up to someone who does? Um, you can also watch it on the screen, of course. Okay, the important, um, the important thing to note is that we have uh, within this screen um, a, uh, a set of information on different com elements um, that provide us information about, okay, this time it may have stuck um, um, may have stuck folks. So if you could let me know if you see it now or in just a minute, uh, that would be helpful. Okay, so uh, we see different elements of a screen here. Um, on the upper left is this area called project, and this shows the, the components um, of, the, um, of the screen. And uh, then we see various windows around the screen, like palette, main, properties, problems, and projects. And each of those is gonna provide different information about this project or about elements of the project. Down here in the properties window, you'll see uh, properties presented on whatever component of the model is currently being displayed. Um, okay, uh, so you folks remotely can see the screen right now, is that correct? Uh, yes, okay, okay, thank you. Um, thank goodness. Uh, okay, so the next thing I'd like you to do is to right click on the, um, uh, on the project itself so, so where it says the name, and I'd like you to do new active object class. Active object class is going to be a class that um, can be presented, that is, it's, it, it, it can be visible, um, it can have a presentation associated with it, it can also have logic associated with it. And uh, there's two types of active object, uh, objects that we're commonly going to be deal with, active object classes. One is main, and one is any, a any agent classes. So in this case, we're going to call this person, okay? Um, and um, we'll say uh, finish. And what you'll see is that there's a new, uh, a new class shown, um, as indicated by an A with a, um, a red circle around it, called person in the upper left, okay? Um, uh, what we've just done is, is add a class which is going to eventually represent personhood. But to make it an agent class, a class that can be used to describe particular individuals within the population rather than a more um, global class or a class that simply is more general and having properties, we're going to have to select it. Down in the properties, you should have properties for person, and you can select agent. Okay? You'll notice when you select agent that it switches, switches the icon back and forth from a uh, uh, a, a sort of A with a circle around it to a dimension um, thing that looks like the measure of man. Okay, so so in short, um, it's going to um, it's going to look uh, like a different icon. Um, okay, so um, back uh, back at this model here, 
what we're going to do, we notice that there's a, a little star next to the, to the name of the project. That's an indication that's been modified. Um, for those of you who use GNU Emacs, um, you may remember that uh, as, a, as an old um, way of indicating that. I think it's also used more broadly by Eclipse. And for those for whom this is a meaningful statement, um, this framework that we're using here in, Nan in AntiLogic is based on Eclipse. It's what's called the Eclipse RCP uh, framework, Eclipse Rich Client Platform. And um, in fact, there's a, a, a toolkit that allows you to build these sort of uh, frameworks um, that make use of uh, Eclipse plugin technologies. Um, Eclipse being a very, very uh, popular editor and um, tool set for working with um, uh, with uh, uh, projects, uh, software engineering projects of various sorts. It's actually a very flexible engine that allows a lot of work with databases and other things as well. Okay, so uh, we've just added in person, um, and let's orient ourselves with respect to this. So uh, in the lower left, you'll probably see the problem window, and, and this window uh, is gonna indicate um, problems, particularly, uh, specifically, what are called compile time problems. So problems in making sense of this project by any logic. Um, it's not gonna capture problems that occur when running the model. Those will instead occur in this place called the console, um, which is located, uh, uh, located down, uh, down here. Um, so problems will show uh, various problems uh, uh, that, that uh, occur when the model is when any logic is trying to understand the model so that it can make it runnable, okay? Um, another key element is going to be this palette on the upper right. And this palette itself is going to be divided into a number of subcomponents. Here you'll see general, system dynamic, state chart, and um, sometimes these, uh, these are going to be um, expanded and sometimes they're, they're not. Um, down at the bottom, there's a set of other palettes that you can engage, you can uh, enlarge or or shrink down. So um, these areas will be what you add in to any logic. And in fact, we used this last time to add in what? And the last time we had a class with me here, what did we do from the palette? What did we add in from the palette? Does anyone remember? We added in a transition. We added in a new transition for waning immunity, which is actually going to be quite s quite similar to what you're going to do for your problem set. Okay, that's going to be one of the steps uh, along the way there too. Now, arguably, most critically, um, there's going to be an area in the middle of the screen uh, here, at least in the current layout, which is called the canvas. Now, this layout is actually um, movable. You can actually drag these things around in different places. Um, to, to figure out where you want to put different windows, and um, it'll actually reconfigure itself. This this all comes with Eclipse RCP, but um, we're gonna we're gonna keep them uh, up here in the center, and uh, this is called a canvas, or that's my name for it anyway, and um, uh, it's on these uh, surfaces that describe both the visual properties and elements of the logic associated with this model. Those elements of the logic are going to be drawn from this palette in the right and added to the canvas. So you're going to take things from the palette and put them on the canvas to describe model functionality. Now, in contrast to system dynamics, where our basic um, uh, basic elements of building a model were stocks and flows, auxiliary variables, but really it all boiled down to stocks and flows and, and some constants. Uh, here we have quite a large vocabulary associated with the model. We have parameters, events, dynamic events, variables, collections, functions, as well as states and various components of them, etc. So it's a much larger vocabulary we're going to have at our disposal for building these sorts of uh, agent-based models. Okay? Um, you'll notice in the upper left-hand corner there's a view menu where you can enable and disable um, menus. So for example, if you don't want to see a, the search menu or the search tab, which is down here in the lower left, you can go up and, and disable it and it will disappear or you can enable it again through that, through that view menu. Okay? Um, and uh, you'll notice that, that sometimes if you, if you want to minimize a window, let's suppose I minimize the, um, uh, this window down here with problems. 
you minimize it, it will go off to the side here and you can get it back by clicking on it and, um, and it can actually come back or restore it to its original position. Okay. So that's just sort of getting to, way, to know your way around this, uh, this interface. Okay, um, right, um, so let's talk about each of these components of the, um, of the project here. We have this main class which describes the stage on which agents will strut, the stage in which they'll move around. It, it provides a global environment, global in the sense that it, it cuts across the entire model. It, uh, it is, it's the overarching highest level element in the hierarchy. Um, of what's going on. Now you can have several main classes, okay? So you could in fact have several main classes, but only one of them will be active for a given experiment, okay? Um, the next thing down is this person class, which is an example of an agent class. You can add as many agent classes as you want, but bear in mind that each of them will describe not a specific agent, a particular person, for example, but personhood. But you might have different um, classes associated with you know, deers and people. Um, if you had a model that involved hunting and risk of uh, communication of a prion-based disease. Or you might have cars and trucks of uh, different sizes, different classes. Um, you, might, uh, you might have males and females uh, as separate agent classes. And um, it's going to be up to you as to when to decide to make them one class. One general rule that, that is often used is you'll make them a general class if the difference between two things is merely a matter of degree. It's merely a matter of, of um, sort of the, the value of a certain parameter, the value of a certain, um, certain element. If, but their behaviors are fundamentally the same, you'll put them in the same class. If you, if you have behaviors which are fundamentally different between sorts of things to be described, the sorts of individuals to be described, then you'd often make them separate classes. Okay? Um, this is a, a rule of thumb, which um, can be sometimes overridden due to pragmatic considerations. But when you're thinking about creating classes, if it's merely a matter of degree, um, you should often just fold them into a, to one class. But if there's qualitatively different components, you'd have separate classes. Okay, yes, could I answer a question here? Uh, could I give an example? Sure. Um, so uh, let's suppose that we had um, uh, males and females within our model. If we have qualitative different behaviors within our model that we want to be associated, maybe females are associated with um, uh, behaviors of, of uh, uh, giving birth um, and um, a set of behaviors associated with uh, certain types of other activities that are qualitatively different than males, then we might put them in a separate class because then we would not we would have each, each um, described with different mechanisms. On the other hand, if we, if we have them not particularly distinguished within the model by any sort of behavior, they're just um, any fundamental behavioral differences. They just are circulating as different individuals and uh, those elements uh, involved that are unique to each are not essential to our model, then we put them as a single class, okay, a class of person, something along those lines. Again, this is a rough and ready rule that, that is often used in object-oriented software engineering, but um, uh, the distinction being if you have very different behavior, you sometimes think, well, okay, a, a, a class is um, is, is a different class is, is needed for, for each of them. Okay, um, so sure. Uh, similarly, if we had, let's suppose we had um, deer, um, deer and moose and elk, okay? Um, I think in Chinese those all have basically the same name. Um, but the question is if they have different behavior, so uh, I think uh, I know enough about cervid uh, behavior to say that, that elk do have somewhat different uh, behavior from deer and, and somewhat different behavior from moose. Um, and for example, moose are a lot more solitary. Um, deer are, um, uh, in, particularly female deer, engage in much more herd, herd type behavior. Um, uh, elk, uh, 
elk exhibits and certain types of rutting behavior. So those might be three different classes if it's important to capture those behaviors. If it's not important, you might put them in as, as one class, okay? Um, so the important thing is that these classes represent whole, whole sort of groups, types of agents. So really we're, we're, what we're describing here is personhood, okay? Um, now the final component is the experiment class, and that's the bottom one uh, here. And you'll notice if you click on it, and you'll see in the properties window it says simulation experiment. Go up to the general tab here, and um, you'll notice that each experiment depends on a particular primary class, particular global class, particular main class. Now its name may, be, may or not be main, but it's, it's functionally you need a class which serves as kind of the overarching environment. You can have a model that is hierarchical, that for example exhibits individuals within neighborhoods, within cities, within a region, within a country. You can have that with different levels, but there needs to be one top level one. And you'll notice on the right hand side here, it allows you to choose what is the overarching class. Here it's main. Okay. So, so uh, it will be, um, it'll be the main class. Okay. Um, and then there's a bunch of other um, uh, things that you can set here that we'll be coming back to later, um, among other things, aspects of the random, um, the random number generation, aspects of assumptions to use for this run as, as delineated by parameters, something we'll hopefully get to later today. Okay, so, so let's, talk, um, uh, let's talk in a little bit more details about um, what belongs in these palettes. These palettes that you see here um, in within, oh, excuse me, on these canvases, these canvases you see to the right can contain logic and they can contain uh, visual elements, um, typically in some ways uh, linked to that logic. So if we, if we double click on the, the simulation class, you'll see to the right, for example, a button. And this button does something. Um, you'll notice it, it um, it has a label associated with it, but it has an action associated with it as well. So when you press this button, it undertakes some action. If you double click on person, there's no logic and no presentation currently associated with it, and main is the same, or no customized logic or presentation. So um, we're going to actually uh, create a representation visually for a, um, uh, for a person, okay? Um, and uh, what I'd like to do here is to uh, double click on person and I'd like to drag in from the presentations area of the palette, which you'll have to scroll down to, a, an oval. And I'd like you to center it in the upper left, sort of like, like so, okay? Um, now, uh, you'll notice that if you scroll over, there's kind of a, a, a coordinate system, as it were, and I'm actually centering it right at that, um, that center point, okay? Um, turns out that that's, that's the origin for an individual. So anything, uh, the individuals will have locations, and those locations will map to locations on the screen. And if we put something square on this origin, just like this circle is, so what did I do to drag that circle? I dragged it from over here in presentation, dragged it on. This thing will be squarely on top of their actual location to which they're assigned. If we moved it to the right, this oval would appear to the right of their actual location um, in, in physical space. So, so basically this coordinate system associated with an individual shows relative to their actual location where do, where do visual representations appear. Okay, um, so uh, what we're going to do here is to um, is to now uh, go to main, double click on main, and we're going to drag in from person to main. Okay, um, we're going to click on person and drag over to main, and and then we should call it population. So so type the name population. If you forget to um, to uh, change its name and time, you can go down to this properties window and type it down there. So we're changing the name of, of the individual. And I'm going to come back to some points I'm just glossing over right now. Um, so in short, what we're doing is we are going to, um, 
create a little population of these of these persons, okay? So I've, I've dragged that in there, and then just below here um, in this properties for this population, I'd like you to click replicated, and I'd like you to put a size here of 100, okay? And um, what I'd further like you to do is to, um, to go, and we're going to give this person, uh, associate this person with an environment. And that environment's going to describe sort of where they can live, et cetera, okay? Um, but uh, we're going to do that in, in just a minute. First, let's try running this model. I like ad-libbing a bit. So to run it, we right-click on simulation. And you notice the simulation colon main because that's the main class associated with it. So we're right-clicking on this thing. And it's, it's going to be starting to run. And what we see is, is something that's not terribly interesting, but it's a big circle. And then this is the thing that says population. Anyone want to guess what this 100 means? When you see that 100, what does that mean there? Those are from computer science background. What does that connote to you? If you see something like this. Population with a, with a um, beginning, an open uh, square bracket, and then a 100, and then a closed square bracket. It's like an array. It's a collection. In fact, if we click on it, we'll see that this collection consists of a number of individuals. And we can go up here, this is again in sort of our exploration menu, we can go up and navigate down to that population, and in fact we can browse among different members of the population. But these population members are, 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 are not particularly distinguished right now. They're, they're all showing kind of the same appearance and so on. We're going to, to modify this, okay? Um, so uh, we're going to uh, so what we've just seen is how to run a model, essentially. We saw that last time a little bit, but you can right-click on it and do run. And now we've created a population. But to, to lend this population, to make it interesting, we have to distinguish these population members in, in some ways. Maybe they're distinguished by who they're connected to. Maybe they're distinguished by their properties. Maybe they're distinguished by their location. Um, we're going to start by associating these individuals with with a different location. To do that, what we have to do is, within the palette up here, we're going to have to go and go up to the general area and drag in an environment, okay? The environment is kind of going to be in charge of telling what agent to live where, okay? So I've gone up to palette, general, and dragged in an environment. And I'll leave its name being environment, that's fine. And all I'll do is go down to population again, and and you'll notice when I click on population uh, within the properties menu uh, under the general tab, I can fill in some information and I'll fill in that its environment is, is, is that environment. So I have to spell out the name. Now, those of you um, who are interested in saving yourself some work, and probably everyone is, um, can start typing and do on PCs its control space um, that will typically uh, typically complete things, but I don't know if it's because I'm broadcasting this, but um, it's, uh, it's actually not uh, completing it right now. I think on Max it's, it's um, a different key. It's like command, um, command space. In any event, um, we will go and, uh, and now run this again. Okay, so we're going to Run, run the simulation. Oh, it's unhappy. It says environment cannot be okay. I misspelled it. That's that's probably why. Um, in environ, I, I call it environment. Okay, fine. Um, and I can do model another. So I can do model build. You'll notice we just saw quite inadvertently a use of the of the the problems window. This this told me a message down here and actually sh flagged it for me here as well. With this, with this red X, right? So if I if I correct it, I can do build, and it will make sure that it's it it understands it properly, and I can run it. And running it actually builds it. It has to understand it in order to run it, and so it does that same check. Building is a process that includes for those for whom this is a meaningful statement includes compilation of the model, 
includes, in fact, generation of the Java code behind the model. Um, and so now if we run it, we should see something like this. Now, each of these circles that are here, um, can, can you folks remotely uh, see the circles um, on, on my screen there? OK. Um, OK. Uh, comes and goes. OK. Um, OK, that's, that's unfortunate. So I've, I've just associated circles with each agent, and, um, and we've associated the agent, uh, the person class within an environment, actually, excuse me, the population within an environment. And, and now if we circle through, we've run the model, and if we circle through each person in the population, how did we do that? Well, we went down here um, from main, we, we stepped down to the population, um, in this navigation window. And if we click here, we'll see that each person's at a different location. You see that? Okay. So each of these persons has been told where to live by the environment. Why is that? Because the population has been associated with this environment, which keeps track of where people are and who's connected with who. Okay. Um, Populations associated with the environment. Now you could keep track of that separately. It's just that any logic provides a simple way of doing it through the environment. Okay. Um, so, so here we have agents that are now a little bit different in the sense that they're located at, at different places on the screen. Okay. Um, so what are these things we're dealing with? Well, for those not from computer science background, I, I wanna I wanna talk just a little bit about this notion of a class. So I noted that person was describing personhood or personness, what it means to be a person. And in this case, all it means to be a person is that you have a representation of a circle which appears wherever you appear. And uh, if you're within this population, you're associated with this environment that tells you where to live. So you have a location as well. Um, uh, you can think of this person class as like being a mold. It's a mold that can create many copies of particular people. So we could have, and if, when we went up to main, um, and we click on population, the main class in the canvas, we click on population, we had replicated 100. We could have 100. We could have 10. I'm going to rerun this population, this thing with, with a smaller number. We could have 10, in which case there's fewer of them. And in fact, we could have an arbitrary number. Um, uh, zero or more agents. Um, I'm going to restore that to 100. But the point is, uh, person, the person class describes, it's like a mold. It can make, using a mold for Christmas cookies, you can make as many Christmas cookies as you want. And they all have the basic shape, the basic <laughs> character defined by that mold. So it is with these persons. They have the basic character, the basic behavior, the basic information as specified by the class but they'll differ in their details. Some will have sprinkles on them. Some chocolate chips. Some bubble gum. Well, okay, maybe not. Um, but uh, they'll have different, different sort of characteristics that will distinguish them. And, uh, but they're all, their basic behavior, their basic data, information they maintain is described by person, okay? Um, Okay, so um, a class is like a mold, and we specify that class here at what's called development time or, or, or um, specification time, and then we're going to run the model, and it actually plays out in in sort of uh, uh, you know uh, exact um, exact synchrony with what we told it to do, um, exactly what we told it to do, regardless of whether or not that's what we wanted to tell it. To so there's this distinction here between design time on the one hand and execution time on the other. Okay, um, so we're building up visual representations within the person class, and we draw here a single circle. But when we run the model, there'll be many particular persons, and each of them will have this circle associated with it. Okay, so just because it's one circle when we see it here doesn't mean it'll be one circle at so-called runtime when it's when in fact the model is is running okay um, okay so let's um, and, and in general in any logic 
our elements in the model, our main class, our person class, etc., are going to have visual representations associated with them. Um, let's, let's go up to main, double click on main. Um, again, ad libbing a bit here, but let's trying to make a point. Let's go up to main and let's, let's go up main and we'll drag in some text, okay, from the palette. Um, so I just dragged in some text here um, from the presentation area. And I'm going to say, uh, we can leave its name be, um, you know, text, that's, that's fine for now. And I'll say, you know, this, uh, this is the main, uh, the main class. You'll notice that in contrast to person, main only has a single, there's only a single main around when the model runs. And it's actually labeled up here. I can right click on the display. If I run the model and I right click on the display, I can drag it around so I could see more areas uh, around it. But you'll notice there's a label that says this is the main class that's uh, labeled up there in the upper, um, the upper left. So for agents, generally there's going to be many agents circulating for a given agent class. For main, there's only one. For those with computer science background, what is that called? when there's only one so-called instance of, of a class that, that ever exists. That class is called a what class? Okay, it, it, it can be associated with static. That's, that's a very common um, uh, set of mechanisms will commonly be implemented as static. But there's actually a name for that class according to a common pattern. It's a, thank you, singleton class. It's a singleton class. So that's a, for those not familiar with it, it, within software engineering, there's a there's a substantial variety of what are called software patterns. And one of them is called the singleton pattern. And this is the singleton class, okay? Person. Okay, um, so um, what we're going to do here is um, successfully refine uh, this model. Um, to include additional additional elements, okay? Um, we've seen uh, how the environment can be used to associate people with location. Um, we've seen a little bit about um, how experiments work. Um, experiments provide a lot of additional features we're not talking about now, including things like how much memory is to, is to be devoted. For those who are, for whom this is meaningful, it, it includes um, uh, parameters for the Java virtual machine for exactly how it's run. If you wanted to link in, for example, to a uh, debugger, or you want to link in to, um, uh, to mechanisms for profiling, this is where you could put that information. Um, it can also include an import section, and it, and, and, it, and it contains sections that deal with model time, how long to run this model, etc. Okay, so um, and some details about sort of how it's displayed at, at, at runtime, which have, have bearing on efficiency, it turns out. Okay, um, so um, what we're going to be doing now is, is elaborating this. We've already had the environment setting the context of these things. We're going to um, uh, now go and, uh, and we're going to actually associate agents with networks, okay? Um, so, you know, in fact, I think I'm going to do this uh, a little bit differently, just conceptually. I, I, I think it might be simpler to first deal with parameters um, within this model and, and agent properties. So I'm actually going to switch to a, um, uh, a uh, different presentation here that's uh, specifying agent properties. Um, and we're going to add in some um, some elements called uh, parameters, okay? So what I'd like you to do is to go to this model and we're going to go over here to the palette and we're going to drag in a parameter, excuse me, into person. So open up person and this is going to be a parameter at the person level, okay? Um, so we're going we're gonna to have our agents differ according to so certain types of information. Now a parameter is simultaneously a mechanism for stating an assumption about some component of the model, in this case an assumption about the persons, um, 
typically it's a static assumption. It's an assumption that doesn't change over time. So uh, it might be something like the gender, or it might be something that only changes slowly, like um, uh, level of, of education, or it might be ethnicity, something again that doesn't, doesn't change. So, um, so here we dragged in from the palette parameter, and let's, let's create a, a parameter that is going to correspond to uh, income and sex, okay? Um, so we'll actually drag in two. Sex will be um, encoded in a classic biostatistical way um, using integers, where zero corresponds to men and, and one corresponds to uh, women, say. Um, so uh, there'll be a parameter called sex here. Um, and then there'll be another parameter called income. Okay, so uh, I just dragged it in. Now, now sex here again, I, I set it to be an integer, which means it's, it, it's some round number, zero, one, one, two, three, but it could also be minus one, minus two, minus three, et cetera. Um, in this case, it's limited to zero and one. Later in the class, we'll see how this can be more elegantly described. How would I elegantly describe the sex of an individual so that I know that two is illegal, for example? so I don't have to worry that someone's going to enter two. And so that I, I can clearly define, um, can clearly see when we're talking about a male or female without remembering what does zero mean, what does one mean. Can anyone tell me who's, who's seen some of this material before or from computer science background? If, if you had your choice how to describe the sex of an individual, what might you associate to describe that? And four letters. Yes, you'd use an enumeration, e num, exactly. We'll come back to that. That's actually a much more elegant way. But for now, we're, we're going to stick with some simple things. And for income, I'd like it to be a double, a double precision value. That's a floating point value. Um, OK. OK, yeah. So a double, a double means a double precision floating point value. And that, that sounds like techno jumble. Um, so that probably doesn't help that much. Let me let me um, uh, let me see if I can uh, work uh, uh, work this in a more manageable way. So um, it turns out that when we describe numbers on a computer, okay, there's um, if we stick to sort of common numbers, we're not going to get into complex numbers and imaginary. Um, things you know that are that are imaginary but we're just dealing with sort of common everyday numbers um, there's two basic types that we deal with okay one is called an, an integer and there's subsets of integers called whole numbers etc but but basically these are numbers that round and they're they're exact values they're the counts of things for example zero one two three four those are those are integers okay um, the other type of number we commonly deal with is what is called a real number. Okay. Um, and it's denoted mathematically with this kind of funny R with a second bar on its left. And a real number it describes uh, values that are, um, are not merely counts. In fact, it turns out there's a lot more real numbers than counts. These are things that, that involve decimal points. Like 3.14159.2627 or um, 2.718. Um, these are these are quantities that are um, that can exist to an arbitrary little level of precision, and that are not merely round quantities. They they um, they can involve fractional components. Okay, um, so pi is an example, or e, or or you know um, the uh, square root of two. Um, that's an example of a uh, of, of a real number. It's uh, it's not a round uh, round number. So 1.5 would be a, a a real number. Okay. So um, these real numbers uh, need to be represented on a computer, but we can't represent them to all the precision that we'd like to. Uh, we can actually represent integers quite precisely, but only a finite set of them. 
And so we can represent integers in Java um, using the so-called int, the thing we labeled for sex. Oh, I should know this. Um, I'm embarrassed they don't. But it's, it's, I think it's from like minus 2 to the 31st to, to, to 2 to the 31st minus 1 or something like that. It's, we, can, we, can, we can describe a large number of these numbers, and it's exact. 0, 1, 2, 3. When it comes to real numbers, we don't have the luxury of, of describing them precisely for most of them. There are some we can describe precisely, like 2.1, 2 2 3.2, things that have a finite number of digits after the, the decimal point. Um, but, um, but there's going to be a large number we can't describe precisely. And in general, we have to encode them. We have to characterize them within our programs um, in, a, in a way that captures their values. Now, it turns out this is tricky because we may have some numbers circulating in our programs that are very, very large. 386,282.596. Um, um, and I think there's laughing. <laughs> I'm picking numbers not entirely at random here. People are catching on. I think. Um, so, uh, so you know, if, if you want to describe something that's very, very large at the same time as something that's very, very small, 10 to the minus 15 or something like that. You know, point zero 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 one, um, ten to the minus fifteen. Um, if to have those circulating within in in the program simultaneously, so you can add them together and subtract them and combine them, it turns out there's a lot of trickiness there. But to encode those numbers, we make use of a representation. This is probably more than you want to know. <laughs> we make use of a representation that can describe things that are very, very large and very, very small. It just won't do to say, OK, we'll represent three digits before the decimal point and five afterwards, or something like that. That just won't cut it. Because we want to be able to represent numbers that are very big and numbers that are very, very small. So we make use of what's called something, uh, it's called a floating point representation. Okay. The, the point doesn't have to be at some fixed location. It can, it can be there's many digits before the floating point or many digits after the floating point, and, and it can kind of scale for both. Now, <laughs> it's not infinitely flexible. I can't do arbitrary number before, you know, very, very large number before, very, very large number after. Um, but it can handle a broad dynamic range, as it's called. And so, so, uh, this is getting close to answering your question, I hope. <laughs> um, so uh, this is called a floating point representation. And the key point is they're all to represent, floating point representations try to represent real numbers. Do anything with decimal? Like, I'm yeah. trying to figure out how I know. Yes. You know, yes. If it has a decimal point and there's something after the decimal point, then okay. then it's you're, you're trying to approximate a real number. And the computer's going to be inexact about it. That's why sometimes, have you ever noticed in programs when you've been doing calculations, sometimes sometimes you get back a number that's like 0.11111, it, or, or, or sorry, or, or 32.00000001, or 32.999999. And, and actually, the answer is 33, but, but it just it, it had a so-called round off error. It, 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 it turned it into this number. It's very, very close, because it can't precisely represent these. These, in fact, oh, w w would I only be able to give you a lecture on, on the, the pristine beauty of, of the sort of numerology involving these numbers? Because it turns out there's a lot more of these real numbers than there are. There's, a, there's if for both real numbers and integers, um, there's a, uh, an infinite number of them. But there's, more, there's a bigger infinity of these guys. Um, uh, the, the cardinality is larger of, of, of real numbers. But the point is that when we have these numbers with things after the decimal, that, that's an extremely crude way of me saying it, but, uh, but it's, it's pretty close to the truth. If we have numbers with things after the decimal point, they become doubles. And why? They're, because it stands for double precision floating point values. And we need a floating point representation in Java here to represent um, 
to represent these uh, these real numbers. Okay, we that's that's when we use that. If we want something that that's not merely an integer, that's not merely something that's true or false, that's not merely something which is a character string like like you know A B C D E F G or something like that. Instead, if we have something that's a a, a partial number, a, a a number with a round, some some um, round, you know, non-round components, um, some some fractional components. Then we use a, a floating point representation, and double is more precise than a single single precision floating point, which can can't handle nearly as big um, a range of numbers. So we use double as our sort of typical way of representing this. Okay, so. In short, if you smell, if you see, a, if you see a um, number that is a fractional component, think double. Okay, that's a, maybe a little bit of double speak. But um, does anyone else have? Uh, I, I've tried to explain it, but uh, does anyone else have a, a, a good way to explain this to someone from outside of computer science? Okay. Um, When to when to use it? If you right, if if you want to if you want to record things uh, that are are uh, not merely counting like zero, one, two, three, or minus one, minus two. If you want to if you want to have something with a fractional value, age would be an example. Maybe you want to record people's age um, as uh, you know not merely zero, one, two, three, four, five but you want to actually record so that you'll know it's 3.5 years since they've been born, right? Um, uh, there's things where you might want to record someone's birth weight in kilograms, and that's something where there's going to be things after the decimal point. Um, uh, you know, th those, are, those are examples of things, and, and you're going to have to ask yourself, do you need that extra information? And, and a key point there is some information, a little bit of information is lost, but it can keep track of very, very large and very, very small information. Bad things start happening when you start combining very, very, very large numbers with very, very, very small numbers. It starts forgetting things. It starts, it starts, uh, it's, it's unable to keep track of all the information you like. And it will sacrifice things by rounding. Okay. 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 Good question, though. I'm glad you, you brought that out. Um, any other question along those lines? Okay. Um, so here we have two characteristics, these parameters. Now, folks, these parameters serve simultaneously to do two things. Number one, they're going to tell us our assumptions about an individual. Second of all, they're going to serve as a conduit for communication to an individual from the point of its creation. And here the thing that's kind of creating it is, is associated with the, the, the population. Um, but if someone was born, you'd specify it there uh, at the point of sort of where you're saying, hey, create, create this individual with these characteristics. These serve as ways of communicating those assumptions to this point. Okay? In other words, communicating the sex, communicating the income associated with the individual. Okay, so having said that, let's go up to Maine. Okay? And let's go to population. And what we'll see here is that now suddenly within population, so we double clicked on main, went over to population here. Within population, you see these, um, these elements here. And in fact, if you go down to the parameters tab, you'll see it's waiting for information about the sex, waiting for information about the, the income of a given person. Okay? So we can insert formulae here. We can insert expressions here. And so um, for sex, for example, we could um, choose that randomly. Now, here we've chosen it to be either 0 or 1, and any logic um, provides a way of describing this with uh, something called uniform underbar discrete. Now, again, if you go here and you do control space halfway through, it should pull up a, a menu. And there may be some weird interaction going on with this remote recording because it's actually not working right now on my screen, but control space would normally um, normally do that. Um, Dylan? 
uh, on yours, it, can you can you get it to autocomplete right now? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so maybe something like that. So here, this is a call to something. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm making a call just like it's an expression, just like I said, sine of 90 degrees. This is this is something where I'm I'm saying, hey, um, there's some function, sort of an analog to sine, which I can give it just like sine needs a degree number of degrees and or return the sine of that number of degrees. Here we have something called uniform underbar discr, which returns a value drawn from a uniform distribution between zero and one, and and I I've given the, the parameters zero and one. In other words, that's um, that's the range over which it should uh, return this. Now for income, what I'm going to do is I could use a different distribution. I could do log normal, and man, do I wish I had that um, uh, that autocomplete. Um, but I could I could draw something from a log normal distribution, say with a log mean of 3.0 and a uh, log standard deviation of, of 2.5 or something like that. Now, I may have misspelled those, so I'm going to do a build. And it says it's an unhappy camper. OK. Um, so uh, uh, gosh. Um, it does one for three? OK. OK, thank you. Um, is it with capital N? OK. Um, all lowercase? OK. OK, thank you. Um, Wow, you can see how hampered it is. Three parameters. Um, OK, I think this is the minimum. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, OK. So uh, what we've just done is provided expressions for each of these things. Um, so within this population now, when, when a person gets created by this population, it will be each of these expressions will be evaluated. In this case, it will draw a, a, a value for the sex of that person from a uniform discrete distribution. By discrete here, I mean not in the sense that it is sensitive to privacy, but in the sense that it is it is one of a set of, of specific defined values, not a continuous range. Here it's going to be either 0 or 1. Log normal is going to draw from a log normal distribution um, with the specified parameter. Now if we were to run this model, what we would see here is um, is something that visually doesn't look any different, but we could we could go and explore, and what we'll find is people's um, people's characteristics differ. So here's their sex, and here's their um, let me close that. Here's their come on, boom, um, their income. So if we scroll up, we will see that for different individuals, they have different incomes. One hopes that those are measured in thousands. Um, uh, well, that's a that's one. Unwealthy individual. Um, so you'll notice that some individuals are male, some individuals are female. Okay. Um, so here we've just created some heterogeneous individuals. How do we do that? Well, fundamentally, we define parameters associated with the individual. Why parameters? Well, these are things that aren't going to be changing in this particular model or change slowly. And number two, they provide a means of communicating these these assumptions, which are quite easy. So these characterize assumptions about that individual that may change something about their behavior in the model. Okay. Um, now, uh, uh, these characteristics um, can then be used to change their visual, uh, visual appearance as well. Um, but um, I want to generalize this. So here, we had characteristics of an individual that are specified by what? What's specified for, for a given individual? What is it that was responsible for assigning a value of sex and income? Where was that specified in the model? Maine. It's in Maine. And it's specifically it in the population associated with Maine. So if we had different, po we could have different populations, both holding people, and each could have a different population associated with it, with different characteristics. So it's the point of the, the thing that's responsible for creating that individual that, that specifies this. We are now going to generalize this to the level of the whole model. Okay? So we're going to have a parameter, drag in a parameter now for main. 
So double click on main and drag in a parameter to it from the palette. And this parameter is going to be called population size. Capital S. Population size. Now, this population size is is going to describe the number of people in that population. I would like someone not from computer science to tell me, take the challenge, what is the so-called type, what is the, the type of value, the sort of category of value, the general set of types of values that could be, that would be associated with this. Is it a Boolean? True or false? Is it an int? Is it a double? Is it a string of characters? Is it a date? What, what sort of thing will be associated with population size? It's an integer. It's a count of these things. So it's an integer. Boom. OK. OK, now that's great. Now, we can run this model right now, but it won't, the behavior won't change because we haven't, we haven't made this operational. How, how would we make it so the population size that's actually used depends on this parameter? So we've just added this parameter. It's, a, it's kind of a wish that it be the population size. How do we actually make it the population size? How do we realize that? What do we have to do to, to make, in fact, this the population size, to, to realize that goal of making that the population size? Where do we specify the population size right now? What is the population size right now, ladies and gentlemen? 100. Where was that specified? Mm. Mm. Okay. So, okay, let's go to population. That's where it's specified. It's up in general. Okay. So, where do you think we need to put a reference to population size? Yeah, down, down here. Initial number. So, we'll put in population size of of 100, no, sorry, not 100, put in population size. Okay, so that's great. Okay, now, so we have this, this parameter called population size. Who or what is responsible for telling us that? Sorry? Well, okay, this is a, a parameter of main, so it actually has to be told to main when it first gets created. It's the thing that brings it into existence is going to tell it. Population brought people into existence. When it brought them into existence, it told them what sex and income to have, they should have. Whatever creates main is going to have to tell it its population size, what to assume for the population size. And ladies and gentlemen, look and ponder. What is it that creates, <coughs> what is it creates the global environment, Maine. What is it that will bring Maine into existence? So, population created agents. What is it that will bring Maine into existence? Under under what auspices will will the Maine class be run? Simulation. Yeah, simulation. It's the experiment. It's the experiment. So let's go over to simulation. And if we go down to parameters here, now we can specify the population size. So ladies and gentlemen, let us make first a default population size of 100. Mm -hmm. And now let's run it. By the way, this is some arbitrary Java expression. So you could, you could have it drawn. OK, so now we have a population size 100. That's great. But let's go down to simulation again. And let's create another experiment with an alternative population size. So ladies and gentlemen, how would I create a new experiment? <laughs> that, that's a fine solution and, and has a certain um, appeal and elegance to it. So <laughs> no, that's true. Uh, OK, right click on it, copy, and, and we'll say paste. And let's make it a large population. Okay, you'll notice when I paste it, it has a little X. X marks the spot. Um, so it's unhappy with that. And the reason it's unhappy is it needs to be told what the main class associated with this is. So I'm going to call this large population, and I'm going to 
I have to go over here and say what its, act, its main active object class, its so-called root. We as a computer science community in computer science have certain bizarre uses of common terms, and root is one of them. Root, root means different things within computer science, each of them significant, each of them distinct. Um, and uh, it can lead to confusion when speaking, speaking with those from outside the field. This is the root, it's in the sense that it's the, it's the um, top of the hierarchy. Um, and, and that's called the root. Um, for reasons that I'm trying to ponder right now, but don't have a good explanation. It's called the root. Okay, so now we have a, a, a large population, but we have to say what its population size is. To do that, we can go to the parameters tab, and we could say a thousand, something like that. Okay, a thousand. Okay, so so we have uh, a population uh, earlier that was a hundred. Now we have a population of a thousand. Let's run that. Run. So now we have a way of of, of specifying our population size. And if we click up here, we'll see there's a thousand people in the population. So in other words, if we click on the navigation menu on the top, there's a thousand people. Okay. Um, so. Um, so hopefully that that's something um, um, that's something which uh, you know will sink in that that parameters or means or conduits are, are ways of describing assumptions assumptions particularly that don't change much the value of a parameter they also serve as routes of communication of those assumptions and specifically the thing that's responsible for communicating those assumptions is the things that create the things that create that um, object with the parameter. So, so for a person, it's the population in which the person lives that specifies it. Or if you have something which declares the birth of an agent, you have to specify it there. For the main class, it's the experiment, the scenario, as it were, that, that specifies the assumptions. Well, we've just seen a way to generalize our model, to abstract away from making it hard-coded for a hundred people and instead making it so that different scenarios can have different parameters. That, ladies and gentlemen, is an example of abstraction, which is, is, is a concept that computer science really focuses on to build things that are more general and, and more powerful, more modular, um, and, uh, and easier to understand. So, so here we had parameters, and those parameters can introduce heterogeneity. Okay, um, so any questions on what we've seen thus far? Anyone need help? Help? Questions? Okay, so parameters are a very important building block um, of models. Um, just a, a, a few comments on this. One thing that you should notice um, is that uh, when you specify a parameter, and I'm going back to person here, and you go click on it, you can actually specify what says default value, okay? What, what actually that is is an expression you can put there, which if you forget, for example, in this case for the population to specify some formula, it will use this formula that you specified in this area called default value for that parameter. That is not the initial value. That is just an expression that will be substituted in if, if say, for the associated population um, okay, um, let's talk, um, let's talk about another aspect of, of heterogeneity, and, um, and that is going to be, um, harking back to, to the presentation that I sent around. Let's place the agents within a network, okay? Um, so, uh, what we're going to do is, within this model, we're going to go up to main, going to go to environment and and we are going to go to advanced okay within the environment and you'll notice that there's a thing called network type and I'd like to invite you to set it to scale free okay so this is clicking going to main clicking on the environment going to the advanced tab and going to network type scale free okay 
and notice it says apply on startup okay um, we're going to we're going to here um, allow individuals to have different numbers of connections they're going to be connected to different individuals within this network <laughs> okay um, so to get a bit of an introduction to this we're going to first start with making their size based on how many connections they have. Okay. To do this, we're going to see a different aspect of any logic. We're going to see an aspect of its declarative character, um, uh, or additional aspect of its declarative uh, character. So go up and click on go. To, excuse me. Go now to person, and click on it on the circle, and we're going to make. The, per the size of a person's circle depend upon the number of connections that they have. So click on the circle and then I'd like you to go to dynamic. And dynamic will allow you to specify with formulas a bunch of different characteristics of this circle. What we're going to use is setting the radius of the circle um, uh, according, to the, um, according to the number of connections they have. Okay, so we're going to go up to radius x here. So what did I do? I went to person, double clicked on person. It's very important to be in the right class if you're changing things. Um, double click on the circle, so double click a person and then click on the circle and it will show you, it will show you a bunch of properties here. And I'd like you to go to radius, uh, radius x here uh, under dynamic properties. And we're going to set radius x and radius y to depend on the number of individuals to whom this person is connected. Now, those from computer science background, how, if I'm dealing with a particular person, if I'm writing code, writing some Java code associated with a particular person, how do I refer to myself? Sorry? This. Yes. So, so I'm writing code associated with a person. I'm, I'm, I'm putting in some Java little bits associated with a person. And, and I could say this dot. And so I'm going to ask myself a question. I'm going to say, hey, myself, get, get my number of connections. So this is going to be a, a function call, just like a call to sign or a call to, to generate a random number. Um, and it's going to be applied to myself. So I'm saying, hey, myself, how many, how many, excuse me, get connections number, not numbers. I wish I had this autocomplete work. I'm going to have to figure out what, what is going on with that. This dot get connections number. The dot just means it's sort of like uh, an apostrophe in a way. In some languages, in fact, use apostrophes. It means sort of my get connections number. So I'm asking myself, hey, get my connections number. And connections number gives me the number of agents to which I'm connected. I'm pretty sure that's the name of it. So um, how would I check that? Well, I could go up and do file build. Normally, I do, I do uh, control space, but it's not working here. Um, OK, so um, I just built it correctly. Now let's run this then. OK, so we're going to run this. And I just right clicked on the normal one. And now we have, oh, look at that. Now we have some weird oval shapes. Well, why is that? Why are they oval? Yeah, exactly. It's doing what we told it to do, regardless of whether or not we told it to. I wanted to make it both dimensions. That it would do a bunch of odd, um, in my enthusiasm. So now we have individuals, some individuals. What does it mean if they're really constrained here? Yeah, or, or they have few connections. And then some are really wide, so they have a lot of connection. Right? OK. So here we have individuals, and they're actually hitched up in a network. How are we going to? to take a little bit of explanation. So what I'm going to do is to um, is to provide a way to um, 
to basically appear virtually connected, okay? Um, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go and we're going to add onto the agents links, links to other people. I want to walk this through and, and um, uh, in, in the limited time available, I'll, like, I'll try to do it as, as close as I can. So in order to link this person up to others, let's go look, look over here in this uh, palette. Okay, to, to give this person an appearance, I used a, a circle. Suppose I wanted to link them up to someone else. Um, which of these things over here in presentation might I use to link them up to someone else? What thing seems most appropriate? If I want to have them visually connected. Okay, a line. So that's great. Okay, so, so uh, how many lines should I add for them? Is everyone connected with one person? How many people, are they connected to exactly two people? Well, the fact that when we ran that thing, we saw some really wide and some really, some really um, thin suggests that they're connected to different numbers of people. So how many lines am I going to draw? Well, turns out it's going to depend on the person. It's going to depend on information that's not known until I'm running the model. But that doesn't stop me from doing a line. It will just mean the line will have to be copied however many times it is once that number is known. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to drag a line onto the palette, okay? Now, now uh, the plus end of the line should go to the center of the oval. I don't know if you folks can see it, but there's when you drag a line over, I'll, I'm going to do that again just as a uh, rehearsal. I'm going to drag a line over, and this one that's close to the cursor, the, close to the mouse, mouse there, um, the one I'm putting in the center, oh my gosh, it actually has a plus on it, so let me drag it back there. There's actually a plus there. I wish I could, I could show it, but um, there's, a, there's a plus right in the center. That's, it turns out that's uh, important because it has to do with the way the line is oriented. Um, Otherwise, if I say, you know, extend the line, the other end of the line to the, to the you know, this many units to the right, it matters which side of the line I'm addressing, okay? So I've ju just dragged that over. Um, let's, let's run this model after I've, I've, I've added that. So, so let's run it, boom. Right click on, on that, and then I run it, boom. Okay, that's what I see. Is that what I want to see? No. Okay, so, so what tasks do I have to do here? There's two major things that are needed. What we saw there was a bunch of sort of lollipops stuck in their side, right, with these sort of lines sticking. So there's two major things I need to address, to remediate, to fix. What are these two major things? Give me one of them. It has to connect to something. That's good. And what's another thing? Well, well, it should connect to. It there should be possibly several, several of them, right? So, there, okay. So, we're gonna we're gonna do this. We're gonna insert some code um, to do this. Okay. We need to multiply and adjust the lines. Right now, there's only one line. We need one line per connection between persons and another. Okay. And uh, the lines need to connect to the person. So, what do we have to do? Well. We saw already that you can specify these kind of declarative properties, like for the circle. Let's click on the line. You'll notice that there's, and, and go to the dynamic properties for that line. So click on the line and go to dynamic properties. And there's a property called replication. So ladies and gentlemen, how, tell me what code I should insert, because you've already seen it. What code should I insert for the replication? How many, how many times does this have to be replicated? Once for every what? Connection. What is the thing that I need to ask to get the number of connections for an agent? The, yeah, this dot get connections number, right? Um, connections number. You can look that up in the help and, and it'll be there. 
Okay, so we have to replicate it. That's great. That's good. So it's replicated. So there'll be that many lines. And then what else do we have to do here? Hmm? Um, what else do we have to do? Yeah, it has to connect to the other. Now, the key, the key reflection here um, is that uh, if, if, if we're at one point and the agent we're connected to is at another point, and folks uh, who are remote, I'm, I'm looking at a slide right now that's called Geometry to Connect Agents. It's in the, it's in the slides I just sent you. Um, and uh, it, it is showing a diagram with sort of two agents in it. So this index agent A and then another agent B. I need to make the line go over to the right by the difference in the two coordinates. So if the other agent is at coordinate x sub b and I'm at x sub a, it has to go over to the right by x sub b minus x sub a. Hmm? And similarly, if I'm at y sub a and it's at y sub b, it has to go down by y sub, sub b minus y sub a. Okay. So, so this is this is a bit of boilerplate that you typically just have to insert in a model once, and it's one of the more complex little pieces of of reasoning that's going to be required in the lectures. But for this dx, according associated with the line, how far over it has to be? Can anyone help? Give me an expression here. Well, okay. It's going to be something like this. This dot get x. Actually, it's not going to be th this dot get x. Um, it's going to be the, it's going to be the agent, the other agent's x minus mine. If that's zero, there's no dx. There's no change in x. Uh, uh, that's required for this line. It'll be going straight down, straight up. But this change in x is going to be the difference between us. So it's going to be something minus this dot at get x. Well, um, what I have to ask is, what do I have to fill in for this first part of this, for this dot get x? If we look back in this, these sort of slides here, um, this has to be x sub a is is this dot x. That's my x. This that's my x coordinate. How do I get x sub b? What does x sub b correspond to? Let's see. It's the what x value of the connected agent. Okay. So what I'm going to have to do is get information on the connected agent. So I do this dot get connected agent and it turns out that if you go look here you can use index this there's a little sort of light bulb here it gives you a hint use index colon index of the replicated line so if I declared these lines to be replicated as I did above I can know with what line I'm dealing with by referring to index am I dealing with the first line or the zeroth line the first the second the third so this is the formula that I, I want, or something very close to that. Um, uh, this, so I'm saying, okay, hey, start with me. Get my connected agent number <coughs> by whatever the number of the, of the line that I'm dealing with. If I'm dealing with, if I'm describing this dx for line number zero, the very first line, we in computer science, we number things from zero. So if I'm finding, the, if I want to find the zeroth agent, um, or if I'm dealing with a zeroth line, I want to find the zeroth agent. So, hey, get my connected agent zero. Then I get back a reference to that agent, and then I could say, hey, you, agent zero, get me your x-coordinate, and I'll get the x-coordinate for that one. And then I can subtract off my x-coordinate, and that's the difference in x-coordinate that this line has to go over. Can anyone translate for me, how will this be different for dy? Yeah, all it will be is, 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 is the y's um, will be different. 
a wise answer. Um, so you do model builds here. So all I did is paste it in and I changed it to get y. Ladies and gentlemen, shall we run it? The answer is yes. Um, okay, there we go. Now we have some agents that are connected. Um, uh, so there's there's a, a lot of different agents connected. Um, let's go up to environment. Double click, go up to main. Click on environment, and I'm going to actually change the network type so it's it, it's less uh, hideous in its appearance. Um, so I, I went up to double click on main, go to environment, and I go down to network type, and I do a distance based network, and I'll do a connection range of, of 50, and and I'm going to run run this, and we'll run this, and now we see people connected with nearby agents. Long and skinny. Lean and hungry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so remember, we there's there's there exists a bug. Who introduced the bug? I did. Um. So, 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 so uh, double click on person. Click on the the um, on the uh, the circle. And we have to make it radius x and radius y have to be set by the get connections number, and and then we can we can right click on simulation and run it again, and and now we see these these folks connected according to how many connections they have. So that's that's kind of nice. They're connected with their adjacent agents. Any questions on that code I stuck in? Um, the key point is. This looks like a single line. Why did I need this replications code here? Because this single line might, in fact, be what? We need, we, we need more than one line if we're connected with more than one person. We need lines to point to each of our neighboring persons. And then this dx, well, this needed to be, uh, you know, if we're dealing with line 0, we have to figure out how far over that line goes. So we have to ask, hey, get me the connect. If I'm dealing with with line zero, this code will be get connected agent zero dot get x minus this dot x. If I'm dealing with line one, it'll be this dot connected agent of one dot get x minus get x this dot get x. So, so this code will sort of be replicated for each of those lines to do the requisite work. Okay, so that's um, that's good. Let's um, let's uh, close this. So, any questions about this code? And I'll do one final thing, and we'll be done. Yes. Um, yeah, I just I'd, I'd like to check this because mine didn't work, and I think I forgot something. Okay. So my computer's dead now, so I oh. can check it. Okay. Um, can you just run it really quickly with the get connections number removed from replication on that line? Yeah. I think I was missing that. Yeah, this thing here. Yeah. Okay. So the question was, could I run this model with with the replication code missing? So I'm going to run it, and okay, it's going to say. Um, uh, index cannot be resolved okay. to a variable. Okay. Um, if you have your plug, I could look. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it's unhappy in a different way. Uh, basically, if if it doesn't see the replications, it says, "Hey, there's there's no index I can use later." So so it it it, it it'll stop you actually at build time. Okay. There's one final thing, ladies and gentlemen. How would I make the the size of the circle depend instead of on the number of connections? How would I have it depend instead on the the income of the person? So it would be larger if they have a large income. Where would I specify that? If I wanted the circle to be really large people with large incomes, small for people with small incomes, where would I specify that? Um, yeah, exactly. So uh, radius x, radius y, so I go into person, click on the circle, and then radius x, instead of this dot get connections number, will be this dot income. Okay? Um, so, so now we, we have that, it ignores white space. And then um, 
we can we can do this um, and here we go and now we have some individuals with a lot of a lot of income and some with with very few um, so this is someone with a with a modest income here people with small someone with a small income 0.698 etc um, okay and then uh, how if we wanted uh, in this final thing how if we wanted a person's color to depend on how the circles color to depend on their sex Well, it turns out there's there's a color thing as re uh, well, fill color, and so we could have this be. Okay, how do I know whether what their sex is? What would I fill in here to get their sex? If, I, if, if I'm an agent, how do I get my sex? What is it? This dot sex. Yeah. Okay. And and how if I wanted men to appear one color, women to appear another. Let's suppose they wanted, uh, uh, well, I have colors in mind, but uh, I don't want to impose them. So um, let's ask a woman, what color should we use for men? OK, sounds good. Sounds good. Um, it's better than, than some other colors. Um, OK, so uh, if this dot sex equals, we're going to declare men as 0. We're treating men as zero here, um, uh, and that dot x equals zero. I put a question mark. Why is that, folks from Java background? So I will make men pink, and I'll make the women what? What color, <coughs> folks? Blue. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay, it's 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 it, it should be running. I just built it. I did model builds, and it looks like a happy camper. Um, the, oh my! God. <laughs> okay, um, we're scrolling now among the particular. Um, wow, that's that's one wealthy woman. Um, <laughs> that's another wealthy woman. There's a wealthy guy. Okay, um, there's a there's there's a I can't even tell what he is. Okay, there's. There's some other women um, appearing in this network, but it looked like there was a woman. Th there were some that were just uh, too uh, too big, and so they they occupied the whole screen. Was was what it was. So I'm going to change this back to indeed be this dot get connections number for aesthetics, um, and uh, we'll we'll have the income um, devoted in some other way, and and then we could do this, and um, boom, um, there we go. So there's our. Our, our network uh, sorted according to color. Um, is that a thing of beauty? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, so. So review here. What did we do? Well, we did a lot today. Number one, we created a model. Number two, we talked about the elements of the model. The elements being a main class, which is sort of provides a global environment, the characteristics that cut across the class, agent classes, which like main is, is an active object class, but but it can be replicated many times. It describes agent hood <coughs> for a particular type of agent, a particular subset of agents, in this case persons. We also saw experiments, which can specify a heck of a lot of things, including how much memory to use, what you how to use random numbers, or whether to repeat the same sequence of random numbers, et cetera, and, and which specify the basic uh, uh, scenarios that we can use to investigate model behavior. We then went further into the model by introducing agents into the main class. We dragged in the agent class into the main class and created a population which we can include in which we could include replicated agents, agents that are copied many times, a whole pop subpopulation of agents. Now, to lend those agents location heterogeneity, to give them, well, or to give them first a, a just sort of retracing the chronology, to give them an appearance, what did I do? And where did I do it? <laughs> to give these agents an appearance, a circle, where did I what did I do?
If I wanted to change these agents from a circle to a square in appearance, what would I do? Yeah, that a person dragging a square replace the circle by <laughs> square, what have you. So, so I, I give them an appearance by dragging some something from the presentation area to the person. Give an appearance. Okay. And then I went up to main and I wanted to give them a location. So that appearance by themselves, they were all appearing in fact at the origin of, of main. So I, I had to give them a location. How did I give them a location? How did I give persons a location, folks? What is it that gives them the location? Yes, the environment. We can actually do it manually, but that's the convenient way to do it, the most convenient way. So we, we added in an environment to what? To, we add it to person? No, we add it to main. Because that's where this population of agents live. But we associate that environment with the population. So there's a particular population of agents. There could be more than one population. There could be different populations associated with different farms or different cities or what have you. So we associate this population with environment. And because of that, these agents could get locations, and in fact, network locations from, from this environment. That's good. And then we added parameters to agents. Parameters served, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, two functions. What were those two functions that parameters served? They serve to encode assumptions and to communicate those assumptions. And they co were communicated from where? If we have parameters in an object, it gets communicated from the point of what of that object? <laughs> where, where do those parameter assumptions get communicated from? If we have an object like a person, particular person, where, is it, where did it get its parameter from? From whence did they come? From where, in other words? At what point did they get specified to that person? Yes, the, th the place that creates them, which here is the population. In general, it could be where they're created. They're told, you will be born now with these characteristics. It would specify it there. Okay, so those parameters. And we use those parameters we could see, we could use those parameters to specify the, the visual appearance of that agent or other things. We could depend on them for, for the behavior of that agent, in fact. That's great. And then we put parameters in main, and those, the values of those parameters, the assumptions about those parameters were specified. If they were in main, the parameters were in main, what specified the assumptions about those parameters? The what? The scenario, yeah, the experiment associated with it, the scenario, the sort of um, that's specified. And an example was the population size, and, and there are the parameters for that. Okay, so that's pretty good. Um, and then what we did is we further imposed a network on agents, and we wrote a bit of code. We saw, ladies and gentlemen, how each of these, how main and, in fact, person, are um, the visual appearance for this can be declaratively specified in this dynamic tab associated with these things. We could just specify expressions that say, how do you do it? And it takes care of making sure those expressions get called and that sort of stuff. So we could give an expression for radius, we could give an expression of fill color, and these expressions I should have added can be dynamic. Watch this, ladies and gentlemen, times time. Um, and we're going to have this uh, radius x depend now on time. What do you think will be happening as I run this? What's that? <laughs> so we specify expressions, and any logic takes care of uh, specifying expressions. And of course, we could speed this up. Boom. They all popped. Um, OK, so, uh, so these things are declared. There, you just specify the expressions. It takes care of making sure they get executed at the appropriate time. Later, we'll talk about some, some subtleties with that. But that's the basic deal. And, and then we tried to hitch them up in networks. And we saw that, in fact, when we associate visual representations with, say, an agent or with me, we can actually make the number of them be different. Here, we just added one 
one line, but we can make it be multiplied. And then for each of those lines, we could specify a property like how far over it goes in each direction by specifying this index. So that, ladies and gentlemen, sort of covered what we, um, what we saw today within this, within this class. So um, this hopefully will put you in pretty good stead for working on the problem set. So for the problem set, um, uh, I would urge you to, to start on it soon. Um, there's three problems on it. Um, the third problem is very step-by-step. -step. It's just building up a model which uh, has some basic characteristics and will reinforce this exercise we've done today. I'm going to have to ask you in this class to do a fair bit of exercise outside of class time so that I can concentrate more on the conceptual side. Today is an important exception where I want to walk you through the interface. Um, the second element of the problem, so that was the third element. The second element, um, third element is very tutorial. Second element is, is um, involving modifying a model and comparing the results to the system dynamics model that you will have built in the first part. See if you can get started. I will have extra office hours, at least an hour worth, maybe two hours worth on Monday, because it's due Monday, Monday midnight. So see if you can get started uh, on it sooner. And I'm of course glad to meet with people separately if, if you can't make office hours. Okay? okay. See if you can get started on that, and then we'll continue on Tuesday with some um, uh, with describing agent behavior using state charts and. Um, and we'll see how agents can message each other. Maybe on Monday. Maybe on on. Oh, sorry. Maybe on Tuesday. Maybe on Thursday. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Right. That's. Oh yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Okay. Okay, folks. Uh, just one thing on the problem set. I ask for some information like what's the maximum number and so on. Don't sweat counting exactly like and like the time at which it goes exactly below one. Um, I'm I'm not asking you you know for absolute precision there. Give me a rough sense you know. Uh, so I'm, uh, don't go like out of your way to spend a lot of time to get the exact number. If you ha if you can just count roughly the number infected by visually and sort of pausing it at points, that's fine. Don't, don't go to the, as the Chinese would say, don't go to the tip of the horn. Um, just, just, you know, do it, do it uh, to get the, the roughly rough, rough number. If it's off by a couple of time units or off by a couple tens of people, I'm not too concerned. Yeah, data set. yeah a data set is great. That's great. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, uh, that's, that's fine. Okay, other questions here? Yeah. You could, or you could say, does not go within the time window. That's also fine. Yeah, 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 yeah sure. Other questions? Cannot. Do you have a copy of it over there? <laughs> okay, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. None of the links were clicked on the foreign no, links no, for Windows and not on the It just broke them. Yeah, it just. Like 404. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 
yeah, keep me posted on that. I'll I'll see if I can send a mail. Okay. Um. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, what determines what where agents get put in the environment? The environment um, itself um, uh, has, if, if you go to the environment here, and, and Carmel, I'm, I'm going to be with you in, in just a minute for, you, for the discussion, but if you go to environment, um, there's a couple properties here on um, the, what's, what's called the layout type, okay? And, and those properties, by default, it's random. And in fact, by default, it's user defined, which goes back to random if no one specifies it. But actually, you can go through and set from a database or from a file or from other things. If you want to put them in a very specific location, you just assign them to those locations. Um, but otherwise, it can arrange them in various sort of convenient ways. Uh, like if it could spread them on a grid if you wanted to or what have you. But, um, but generally, you can assign them to locations um, at the start. That's and, and actually, one, one thing just uh, along those lines, Darian, um, you'll notice that if you go to person um, and you go to agent, there's a thing here It says environment defines uh, initial location. So in other words, I went to double click on person yep. and then I clicked on agent tab. There's a thing that says environment defines initial location. If you uncheck that, you can specify them here. In oh, fact, for formulas there. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, Carmel, um, uh, are you going to, um, I'm, I'm just wondering here, I think maybe we could continue to talk here. There you are. Okay. Okay. So um, let me ask this. You have Skype as well, right? Um, would you find it uh, convenient to use uh, Skype to uh, to do this? Um, I, I'm just thinking that the sound quality for this, from from what I hear, is a little bit variable. It's up here right now. It kind of goes in and out. Um, okay. Okay. Um. Well, why don't Why don't we start here? And and if it if it starts uh, getting problematic, I can uh, we could fire up Skype here. Okay. Okay, so um, you had sent along your um, your model, um, and, and pardon me for just a second as I stop sharing. Boom. Um, okay, so you had sent your uh, model along. I'm just going to open it up here. Um, but you had specifically noted uh, two questions, um, and um, one of them concerned, as I recall, the the fact that the um, the infection was dying out within the population? Well, actually, it's, it's increasing. Oh, it's so increasing. Oh, sorry. It re so, so, so you were asking about it remaining intimate at a low level rather than increasing? Right. And it's something that I was thinking about um, trying to optimize the situation but I'm not sure that that's going to work. Like, yeah. 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 Um, well, I think what you'll probably find is that um, a few of them, um, a few of them have disproportionate impact on that. Uh, and so, you know, it's true there may be a variety of of these uh, parameters, but probably a few of them have, have the largest impact. And I think one of the key things you're going to want to do is think about. Um, you know which of them are better better known or understood, and which of them are highly uh, uncertain. So uh, I'm just opening this, and this will give me a sense of the uh, particulars of the parameters. Pardon me, because it's uh, people are talking the hallway. I'm just going to um, close the door here. Okay. Yeah. So just a sec. Yeah, so um, you're still there? Okay, so uh, I'm just opening this model and I see there's animal um, and uh, uh, okay, so <clears throat> um, yeah, I've got to figure out uh, yeah, I guess I'll uh,